you know, I mean, maybe we should cut out the IT part if, if we can't get you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you missed, that, you missed that, Kerry. He goes, maybe we should cut out the fact that you're in IT because you can't even stay on the call. <laughs> <laughs> we can't get, you, can't get you on a solid internet connection. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's time for our first giveaway for people that supported us through Patreon in May. First off, the koozies have finally arrived and I'm so excited to start mailing those out, so check your mailbox in the upcoming weeks for those. Now, the winners from May will receive even more koozies and a metallic collapsible flask from our friends over at Liquor Barn. Make sure you listen to episode 50 to learn more about Ray and how Liquor Barn handles the most allocated bourbon in the state of Kentucky. The video with the random drawing was posted to Facebook and YouTube earlier this week, so make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook to see those videos. The winners for May are Wes Height and Scott Allen White. Thank you to everyone that has supported us through Patreon. It means a lot, and it helps us give back to you all as well. We will be having a giveaway every single month, so make sure you go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash bourbon pursuit, and support the show. Welcome back to another episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. My name is Kenny, and Ryan's not here to join us tonight. Ryan has a sick child. Uh, this was kind of like a last-minute thing, having our guest on, and, and I invited a special guest co-host tonight. So tonight we have Blake from Bourboner.com. So Blake, how you doing? Good, Kenny. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. So we haven't talked to you in a while, so at least you haven't been on the podcast in a while. So how you been? Good, good. Yeah, things are going well. I know. I uh, think I was episode number five of bourbon pursuit but I haven't been on since so still listening but uh, you know kind of keeping up with y'all but good to be back on yeah we're close to almost uh, 50 episodes past you now we're, we're getting ready to oh, launch nice. like in the, the, the high 50s so uh, so what's been your uh, most anticipated bourbon release that you've seen uh, thus far in the the past month or two it's I hate to say it but it's got to be the Booker's Rye at this point um, you know, it, that's just a, a huge release, and I got a chance to try it, and it was really good. So, yeah, it, it's that's probably like bourbon cliche at this point, but the the Booker's Rye is definitely the biggest one at this point. Yeah, it, it kind of goes without saying. I think a lot of people are really interested in it, and it's just now getting ready to start hitting in a bunch of markets. I know uh, yeah. our guest on tonight has uh, he said there's an abundance of it where he is, so there's there's nowhere <laughs> no 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 shortage of it. So hopefully. I mean, it's not going to be the same story in Kentucky because, well, uh, Kentucky. But uh, hopefully, we can at least people around Louisville and those kind of cities can can get their hands on it. Uh, I'm hoping it's the same in Jacksonville as well. We'll we'll see. You know, we're uh, we're sometimes late to the, uh, the the new release game, but you know, maybe in two months or so, we'll start to see it trickle out down here. So hopefully, that means more bottles in our area as well. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, we've already seen the Booker's Rye even show up on a few secondary markets, and, and you know, tonight's topic is really going to be touching into uh, the secondary markets and kind of pretty much the, the most annoying things that we see in the bourbon trend today, and I think this is going to be a, a pretty funny show because a lot of us that are on the forums uh, are have been pretty privy to seeing a lot of it, and Everybody just hates it, you know. We'll just start it off with saying the crotch shot, right? Like we all fucking yeah. hate it, but we yeah. we, we all. <laughs> You're still gonna see it in your newsfeed, no matter what. <laughs> no matter what you do. So with yeah. that, let's go ahead and introduce our guest tonight. So tonight we have Carrie. Carrie Bosick, am I saying that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so Carrie Bosick is a blogger at Suburbia.com. So Carrie, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Great. So I guess first uh, question we always ask is. How did you get into bourbon, and then how did that lead into you wanting to actually start writing about it? I guess um, I started in bourbon actually when I went on a diet. It was uh, September of 2014. I decided to go on a no-carb diet, and you know, summer means pool time, which means beer. So you know, drink pounding so many beers every night. Finally, told my wife, I'm like, look, I need to cut out the food and I need to cut out beer. So I did a little research. And realize that bourbon did have no carbs. It has you know a little bit of sugar or calories or whatever. But I actually went on a, a full diet the whole month. It was no carbs, and I had bourbon every night on ice. You should write it like a diet book about this. <laughs> Dude, I say, seriously, I, I lost. I ever realized bourbon could be used as a. I lost uh, like twenty a pounds. Supplement. 
<laughs> wow, 20 yeah. pounds with drinking It really bourbon. is, dude. I lost 20 pounds. Well, that's crazy because, I mean, yeah. but it's just corn, right? So I guess you can't it's really just, just drink all corn or, or and, and try to get that way. But, I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. So, I mean, what yeah. else did the diet consist of? I mean, of course you said you just cut out carbs, but, I mean, is it uh, kind, of, kind of go along with that because, uh, you know, a lot of us, we drink bourbon every night, but I'm, I'm kind of seeing an opposite uh, kind of trend, at least with me, it's it's starting to start, uh, you know go out. <laughs> then it's not go the bourbon. In. It's not the bourbon. It's what you eat after you've had the bourbon, right? It's your your late night snack if you've had a big night of bourbon. To me, that's the biggest difference. But so that that month there was, you know, it was just it was bourbon, and then I don't know what I would have. I just have like meat, um, just no bread, you know, very little, maybe one or two beers the whole month. And of course, you got to exercise. I mean, you got to exercise with any weight loss program, but I did that. I drank the bourbon. Man, I lost so much weight. It was awesome. So I stuck with bourbon at that point. And then my wife actually signed me up for um, around the same time a bourbon of the month club. I had gotten in, um, I can't remember, uh, Colorado State Peachtree bourbon, something like that. I got that in one month, and then I got a couple other ones. And so I started like a shelf of the different bourbons that I had gotten. And I remember looking at it and thinking, this is kind of cool. Like I got some you know, some different choices here. And, and I think it was at right around that time, around October, when I'd first learned about the antique collection. And um, I had no idea how hard it was to get. I, you know, of course you start calling stores when you first get into it. I'm like, hey, do you guys have antique collection? Do you have Pappy? And I ended up at a Total Wine, I want to say like late October. And a guy was walking through the store and I just stopped him and just said, do you have any, um, any of the antique collections? And he was holding a SAS 18. <laughs> in his hand, and he said, this, "I was trying to put this on a shelf somewhere." He said, "Do you want this?" So I was like, "Fuck yeah!" And I like, grab it, and <laughs> you know, ran to my car, and uh, of course, I did the crotch shot. But um, <laughs> that was just it was just so cool to me to see that, like, to actually see. I mean, there, there are amazing bottles, right? So there, I went to a steakhouse here in Atlanta called Little Alley with an unbelievable bourbon list, and I'm like, "How does anybody know what all of these taste like?" And you realize there's so much to it, and it tastes good too, which is kind of the annoying part of this hobby is that everything, I mean, it's going to be around for a long time, right? All of the stuff tastes good. So, you know, I'm just uh, trying it all and still losing weight. So I was like, that's it. I'm in. I'm that's in awesome. Bourbon. I mean, I could, I could kind of picture right now, like if you are going to make a, uh, kind of a, a workout video for this kind of stuff, I could just see you like doing crunches and like taking a sip, like every single time you, <laughs> uh, you get up to the, to the point. So I, I guess also talk about your blog. So what I guess what what inspired you to start creating the blog, right? So we we know how you got into to drinking bourbon in the first place. What inspired you to start actually writing about it? I, you know, I think just being bored one night. I um I've always kind of written here and there. Never really, I don't know. I never really had a purpose for it. It was just something I enjoyed doing. I can't remember what the first. I think I started to write a review. You know, I, I was just telling my wife, you know, it's it for me it's almost become a hobby, which bourbon is a hobby, right? It's something that we as guys or girls who get into it, it's a hobby. It's spend money on it, it entertains us, um, connects us to other people. You know, I mean I, I can't even count how many people that bourbon itself has connected me to, not just locally but around the country. So I think I wrote a review and uh, sent it to like my dad. My dad was like, "This is great writing. You should, you should pursue this." And I was like, "All right, well." So then I just kind of stuck with it, and it's one of those things where I think I write better if I've had a couple drinks. You know, you you start to get the brain working a little bit, and to me, it's just it's just kind of fun. I don't know. It's just kind of like an outlet for creative energy that just gets stuck inside. I mean, I'm I work in IT, bent on I'm kind of a right brain person working in a left brain field. Um, so I guess it kind of gives me that outlet, and honestly, it's just kind of fun. Like I can make fun of people, and they can't respond to it, at least not right there. <laughs> the anonymity um, of the internet, right? Yeah, exactly. So I guess this I think, is a good question for you, Blake, uh, because yeah. you know, we, we've all kind of seen, uh, you know, the, the annoying trends of bourbon starting, and uh, I think the first one is that there's bloggers and podcasters about it, right? Like we're always talking about it. Uh, do you think like? Bourbon's gonna be like the new Pogs uh, because like, it was really in in style like for a good few years and then like it just disappeared like nobody cared about it anymore. Yeah, I, I don't I don't see it uh, just completely going away anytime soon because kind of what Carrie alluded to, it's just really good. So I, I don't think I'm gonna wake up one day like I did with Pogs and just 
you know, throw them in a shoebox somewhere. You know, it's kind of like the cigar boom in in the 90s. Yes, there was a huge boom, and it levels out at some point. Like, I think we all could agree it's going to level out at some point, but I don't think it's just going to be like all of a sudden guys wake up one morning and have no interest in Pappy Van Winkle. I don't know. I, I As much as I would like to think there could be some kind of bust, I think it'll just be more of a leveling out at some point. But I don't know. We I see no signs of that <laughs> that leveling out anytime soon either. No, I'm totally with you. So the other reason we had you on the show tonight because there was a blog post that you actually put out this past week and and it's so it's so hilarious. I mean, I think, you know, I read it, I know Blake read it. I even forwarded it on to a lot of my friends because it's it's literally what we're all dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Kind of kind of talk about that and what inspired you to do that as well. I think I was just angry. I was seeing these traits and honestly, we've done some of them too. So it's not something where I can point a finger at everybody else. I mean, we know that there is stuff that is so ridiculous in this hobby. And it's not just the buyers, it's the marketing, it's the distilleries, it's the store owners. I mean, everybody's guilty of it to some extent, right? So, and I think, you know, when when you kind of make fun of everybody and you're making fun of yourself, you know, you realize it's, you can't take anything too seriously, right? So there's a lot of stuff that some people take really seriously in this hobby. And the truth of it is, it is just a hobby, it's fun, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we're we're enjoying what we do. There's so many people, and, and I, we kind of forget when we're the newbies on the scene, you know, and the things that we do, and it just annoys us now. At least for me, there just was a phase where it gets so repetitive, it just gets really annoying. And so I just thought, if I just mark some of these down, and, you know, it's funny because every when I had people review them, everybody kind of said the same thing. They were like, uh, I kind of agree with everything. <laughs> I mean, there are there are just annoyances <laughs> with this hobby um, in general. I'm sure there's some in all of them, but but there are some that definitely stand out with bourbon right now. Right. So the the title of the article is the top dumb things overheard in the bourbon world, and so I'll, I'll let you do the honors and and kind of kick it off for the first one because I I want to go through all ten of these and maybe we're gonna hit on one or two more that you didn't have uh, because uh, a I think um, it's gonna give a laugh to the veterans that are out there. Uh, and B, it's probably going to help some of the newbies that are out there to be like, uh, I don't want to break these cardinal rules. I think we have all seen the picture of the guy holding the really expensive bottle in his crotch with the tagline, keep hunting, it's still out there. I mean, come on. It's not still out there. You got so lucky. There's a there's a local Atlanta guy who – he has not told me his secrets, but probably once a week he's posting like a 1957, very, very old Fitzgerald, and he's, keep hunting, guys, it's out there. Or the guy who <laughs> who pays 2000 for a Pappy 23 in March and then posts that picture and says, keep hunting, it's there. So, um, yeah, that to me is probably one of my top annoyances because, and you know, look what I got. Congratulations. No, it's, hey, you get out there too, man. You get out there and uh, – Keep looking. You're gonna find it. You know, like I said in there, you know, you, if you win the lottery, you don't tell everybody, man. You should. I won the lottery. You need to go buy lottery tickets because you're gonna win it too. <laughs> go buy those scratch offs. I really wanted to post today because Total Wine released some of their Van Winkle to ten and twelve years, so I got a ten year, and I really wanted to put on my post. Keep hunting, guys. It's still out there. Just, <laughs> just, just as a little make side Carrie bar. happy. Yeah. Do you know it's funny? I actually, I got a twelve year today at Total Wine. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that was nationwide. They released, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I think it, I think that also released. plays into like uh, another thing. You know, you said the guy that pays twenty three or pays two thousand dollars for a twenty three and and was like, look at my score today. And it's like, no, no, that's <laughs> that's not a score. Like you're that or you traded for. Like that's not a score. Like that's mm-hmm. just that's just right, right. that's just part of the game, yeah. right? So I, I that's probably one of my annoyances or when when people I think it was even like this past week and uh, somebody shows a bottle of like a, uh, a like a old school Weller antique like from the seventies and it's like look today's score. I'm like that's bullshit. Like you didn't just go find that in a store today, right? I mean you you paid for it. That's not a score. <laughs> yeah, right. You broke into some house in Kentucky that looked really old, and you found it in the basement, and you ran out before they caught you. I should probably you take that so hobby it's up. Like, <laughs> that's, that's the next on the list. <laughs> so that was number one. Uh, 
Another one that drives me crazy, this still gets me every time, is somebody will buy a bottle and they'll post it online. They'll say, what do you know about this bottle? I just bought it. I'm like, why are you asking us? You bought the bottle. What? Why would you buy the bottle if you didn't know anything about it? And so I think it goes back to the marketing too. It's either the marketing or the store owner who says, I just got, you know, he says, do you have anything allocated? And he's like, man, I just got three bottles of Blood Oath. And it comes in a wooden case, and it's got the coolest looking label on it. The guy says, "Done. I'll take it. How much is it?" He's like, yeah, "110 bucks." So then they post and they say, "Well, does anybody know anything about this bottle?" Like, what are you expecting people to say? <laughs> That's after they buy. Like, I paid 110 dollars. Somebody tell me I I didn't get you know ripped off here. So somebody give me some right. That's probably what they it. want. <laughs> probably half they want justification for paying that kind of money. And then they also Somebody offer me three hundred dollars. Um, yeah, they want to know that they didn't get ripped off, and they want to know that they found the most incredible bottle that nobody else has. Right. So I, I think the other one that annoys me is, is is they'll just they'll grab it like an everyday bottle, like literally just like an everyday bottle. <laughs> it may just be, uh, or even something that's not even like around here, like Caribou Crossings or something like that, and they'll they'll post that, and we'll be like, well, why? No, of course it's not good, but why would you buy it in the first place? Like you need to you need to <laughs> evaluate these things. Like th some stores actually have like tasting bars where you can go and try this stuff and. Uh, I'm sure you've got a friend, maybe one, that could do this, and there's, there's no point in actually purchasing it and going out to the car and then realizing you had a huge mistake, and then everybody's going to troll you for the next, like, three days. So I think part of it is people are lazy, too, right? Like, Reddit is where I started with bourbon, and people will trade samples all day long. That's how I first got into learning about all the different bourbons and ryes out there is that if you go on Reddit, or there, there are even places on Facebook, too, where you can just get a sample of something, or even your local bourbon group, you know, try Gifted Horse before you buy a bottle of it. Just ask if anybody has a sample. I mean, there's so many people love to share samples of stuff, but people are just lazy. They just want to buy what they see and then ask how it is after the fact. So I think that's just a total rookie mistake, and hopefully we can this podcast will get out there enough that it'll, uh, it'll, it'll save us from at least three or four of those in the, the upcoming months. Come on, rookies. All right, so number three is my favorite, but I want you to kind of talk about it. I had noticed, I guess, uh, after I started to acquire some of the really nice, you know, bottles, the Pappy and the and the Antique Collection that people um, would offer, like, regular bottles. And they would, you know, they, they would get a hold of a Weller 12 or an Elmer T. Lee for the first time, and they would offer both of those for a Pappy. And it's like... <laughs> <laughs> really? I, I mean, it, I guess, uh, so another thing, um, I, would, I would say the M10 bourbon and rye, right? So that's, they've had two big releases of that at the end of last year and this year. So they were pretty available. Take roughly the value of, say, you know, a Pappy 15, and they would offer up four M10 bourbons and two M10 ryes to get a Pappy 15 because they're easily accessible. Their store may have gotten a case and said, here you go. Well, I mean, nobody with a Pappy 15 wants six M10s. They just don't. Like, nobody thinks about the reverse of that. They just, and when you try to say, you know, I don't think this will happen, you might want to just try to sell, they'll say, well, I'm sure, you know, that I looked at the values of this, and the values are equal. But the values don't mean shit, because people want what they want. They're not, they don't necessarily want what you have. Right? People want, if they have a rare bottle, they're going to want something they don't have. So they might not want to, you know, get a hold of six bottles that have an allocation in, in of 30000 across them. If you, if you own the Pappy 15, odds are it's going to be pretty easy for you to get a hold of those M10s as well. So it's, mm. there's no point in anybody yes. that's trying to say, like, I'm going to do a 10 for 1 bottle trade to try to make this happen because most people that are going to do that, they, they don't want your lower tier 10 bottles. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, and, as I, said, that's, that's I, I get it. I was the same way at the beginning. I wanted to get hold of William Lou Weller. At the end of the day, sell and work your way up towards it. Make relationships with the stores. You'll get there. I mean, it, you know, Pappy still is considered the the hardest to get. Well, of the main, you know, the ones that are still produced today, Pappy is still considered like the impossible one to get. But the truth is, if you're in the hobby long enough, it's it really it's not impossible to get. You know, you just spend time in it. You're not going to join, get, hop into bourbon, and three months later have a nice collection of Pappy. It's just yeah. not going to happen unless you're willing you're to fill that You're not going to hop in in July and expect to get a bottle by August. <laughs> right. Like, no, it's just not going to happen. Number four, 
listening to podcasts by Bourbon Pursuit. No, sorry, that's, that's <laughs> I, I totally agree. Huge, huge feedback move. Um, this one, you know, I wrote, and I would say it's a little questionable, but you had to it's get to true. ten, though. You couldn't stop at nine. You couldn't. Right. <laughs> this one was actually as personal to me because. Truth be told, I did open everything I got for the first year that I was in this hobby. I still have like 60 open bottles of stuff. But to tell a store owner that you're going to buy a bottle of Pappy 23 and you're going to open drink it, I mean, I don't know if that's completely the truth. You know, you, you get home, you realize how much you could get and trade for it. I don't care what you tell that store owner. I mean, you, I don't know if you're going to open it or not. So I think I, I look back on that one. Maybe that was one that was could have been like 9.5 on my list, but – <laughs> I do. I know that that's people say that a lot, and they they want to use that. I've heard friends say that to store owners to try to, you know, get a hold of a nice bottle. I don't know what the store owner really cares. I mean, at the end of the day, he's getting money, right? So I don't know if he really cares. If because I had heard a couple people use that line, but yeah, I, I don't think that's that's. I think we're all going to do whatever we can to to try to do coax the store owners to try to sell to us above somebody else, right? I mean, so we will say, yeah, of course I'm going to open it, and. You know, some people even go as far as along to saying, like, we'll open it right here in the store. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally see your point because I've witnessed this a hundred times where, um, you know, you will go to a raffle and somebody wins and they're like, oh, my God, this is so great. Like, I can't, I can't believe it. I won. This is going to be save it for – I'm going to save it for a special occasion. And then, like, yeah. literally within, like, three months later, it's on the forums and it's selling for, like, two grand. And yeah. they make some BS story about their grandma being in the hospital or something, right? <laughs> All right. So tell me who, who hasn't done this, though. You say to a, the store owner is going to sell you a, a Booker's Rye. You're like, I'm going to open this, and I'm going to bring you back a sample. And you end up getting another. And maybe the one that he sold you trades for something else, but you open the other one. And you send them a picture, and you say, see, I told you, man, I was opening up that Booker's Rye. I've done that, and I feel no remorse. Well, you bring him in. A <laughs> <laughs> if I was able to get a second, and I actually opened up his bottle, you know what? <laughs> no remorse about that one. <laughs> or six months later, you're in a bar, and you ask for a shot of book, you know, a pour of Booker's Rye. You're like, can I see the bottle too? And you, you position it perfectly so you can't tell it's a bar. <laughs> Take next time you're in the store, you're like, look, remember that Booker's Rye you sold me? Here it yeah, is. yeah. <laughs> I haven't gone that far, but no, I, which that's kind of a separate point. But uh, taking your the store owner and manager samples goes a long way because a I lot totally of them are agree. just as interested. Um, if I have open bottles of good stuff, I'm like, Who, what's it matter for two ounces? I'm happy to share with them because they're typically just as into it as you are, but they can't get their hands on it just as just as easy, so, but I have felt bad I about that at times. When I got, um, you know, the Fitz 20 that came out last mm -hmm. year, the 375 that was like 300 bucks. There was a, uh, a guy at a store that I, I don't go to as often because it's a little bit far from my house, but a friend of mine had told me that or the World Whiskey whatever was in Georgia, and this guy was supposed to go and work. The store made him stay and work, so he missed out because mainly he wanted to go to try the Fitz 20 because they were pouring it there. So I found out, and this guy didn't even get me anything, and I brought him like a one-ounce sample of the Fitz 20. And, I mean, his face just lit up when I gave it to him. I was like, I don't even need anything. I just heard you, um, you know, you missed out on it. I gave it to him. I think he had gotten me um, like a couple Bourbon County Stout beers. And, you know, it's just one of those things where every time I go in after that, he remembers. But I don't I don't do it so that he remembers. There's, a, there's just a part when you get to a point, I think, when you have so much of the stuff, sharing with people actually feels good for you as well, you know, and I, I think that's why one of the reasons that this hobby has kept me in it for so long is there are so many generous people that are in the hobby that even as we make fun of all of this and talk about the bad people or not even the bad people, but the, the dumb things people say, like by and large people in this, you know, hobby are pretty awesome and love sharing. And it's kind of cool to see that and to catch on with that. So your next one is, is it says, looking for a nice bottle to buy for, insert some family member, for some upcoming event or birthday. Can anyone help me out? Because I've witnessed this one firsthand, and I've witnessed it in a few groups. And it was literally like this past weekend, like, I'm looking for an old Rip Van Winkle to take to uh, one of my, 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 my dad's um, celebration or maybe for, like, this upcoming Father's Day or whatever it is. And I was like, hmm, like I know this guy, and I think he's probably got a horde of them 
already stashed. So I was like, I wonder what, what his motive is behind there. So I have a friend, uh, disclaimer, who um, answers the Facebook messages of several stores here in Atlanta. Because I, I guess he working with them, they said, why don't you just, will you handle our Facebook account? I can't tell you how many times he has sent messages of people who have sent them Facebook messages saying, I was wondering if you guys have any, you know, Pappy laying around my so-and-so relative's birthday is coming up. I mean, literally like once a week, he responds to these of people trying to use that advantage to get a bottle. Now, I totally get, you know, using the secondary market to get birth year bottles or you have a baby and you want to get a year bottle for that. It's totally another thing to go into a store that you have never been into before or to Facebook message a store you've never been into and try to use that to your advantage. You know, they probably don't even have that relative. It's probably not, They don't even have a cousin Bobby. I mean, my dog try- is dying of leukemia, right? Maybe that's a good <laughs> I get that was part of the uh, the downside of having an article that ranks high for the keywords Pappy Van Winkle was and it's about the retail price. I get about at least once or twice a week someone, hey, uh, you know, fiance is graduating from college or law school or would love to get them as a wedding gift. Can you get me this bottle? I'm like, look, you know, here's your best spots. You know, go to Bottle Spot or you know maybe Craigslist or something. It's like, oh no, no, I'm looking for the prices you have on your website. <laughs> like, y- yeah, I- I'm not a retailer. Uh, I would love to help you, but <laughs> I'm also looking for retail prices here in Kentucky. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, you can't even a, find that anymore. If you find it, please let me know. I will uh, <laughs> also get a bottle. Yeah, go dear on. person seeking Pappy, the four roses. Private barrel, barrel strength. Yeah, You're yeah, that's. I have a you know list of four to five bourbons of. Hey, if you can't get them, here's what you should get instead because you can probably find this on a shelf. And if they're not a super super bourbon nerd, they probably will love it just as much. So <laughs> that's the way to go. And that kind of leads into your your yep. next one that is kind of like, will you help me fish, right? Uh, you know, I, I Can you tell me the stores around here that sell those really hard allocated bottles because I don't feel like doing, the, doing it myself and uh, taking the time to either establish those relationships or, or do my own hunting. This is the worst. This is the one that drives me crazy of all of them. I, I mean, uh, so I'm in uh, Atlanta Bourbon Society, which is now like 500 members. And as you know, Atlanta, people are moving here all the time. And I swear every week somebody's posting, hey, I just moved to you know, so-and-so city, which happens to be my city. Can you tell me where to go to find all the really hard-to-find bottles? Like, Yo, no. here, here <laughs> is a list. <laughs> Ask for Jim. He'll give you the rundown. <laughs> That's when you send them to like, uh, you know, whatever kind of quick stops. Be like, oh, yeah, like, they, they just keep hiding in the back. They just, just send them like a wild goose chase. They get robbed, and then they blame Look, you. Look, what you need it. to do is go to East Atlanta. Yeah, you need to go to East Atlanta, and the good stuff is only put out after 10 p.m. <laughs> on Friday and Saturday nights. Where does T.I. talk about in his songs? Yep, that's the spots you want to check out. <laughs> yeah, are these the ones that have, like, the glass cases, like the bulletproof glass windows and stuff behind them? Don't think I had Dusty hunted there, though. Oh, yeah? See, I, 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 not, not me. Not even going to try to risk it, right? So... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty good. So there's the next one is I heard from a guy. There's only seven bottles of this particular thing that's going to be released to the state, even though there's like six thousand bottles. You know, that's that's something that we always hear all the time. Like, uh, oh, allocations cut short yet again this year, and I'm only getting yeah. one bottle, and it's the owner's going to keep it or something like that. Yeah. So uh, I have a buddy who works at National Distributors here in Georgia, and he will tell me, like, getting X number of cases of so-and-so bourbon. Store owner told me the state is only getting seven bottles. And you're like, no, it's actually getting 13 cases, but, you know, (laughs) if you want to assume that seven is actually the number, that's fine. Um, And store owners, I don't know how it happens, but it does happen all the time that store owners are told the wrong information all the time. And... Yeah, it's pretty easy if you just know somebody in the industry to verify that number. You can even ask the distributor, you know, the distributor or even the distillery, hey, I heard there's only, you know, no bottles of so-and-so are coming to the state. Is that true? And they can answer the question, but most of the time people just like to pass along the rumors. I think people always want to make it sound like every release is so unbelievably limited so that they don't even try to hunt for it. You know, they 
Knob Creek, man, we are only this new Knob Creek 2001. We are only getting like 14 bottles for the state. And then I think they released like what thirty eight thousand bottles for this. About thirty. Yeah, yeah. you guys would know better than I all would. at once because I think yeah. it's all three all batches at once. at once. Yeah. And it's uh, you know people are saying oh man we got I don't even think Virginia's getting any this year. Yeah, you know Virginia's getting some. Okay, settle down. You're getting plenty. So I kind of I kind of already spoiled the uh, the next one, which was saying like uh, when a store owner says I only got one bottle. So uh, I, I can't help you out. I've been confronted with that uh, many yeah, times. No, they didn't. They got more than one bottle. You know, we, we talk a lot about the consumer here, right? Store owners say a lot of bullshit. I mean, they do. There are some stores that are straight up honest with you, and they're awesome. And if you find those stores, stick with them. Give them your money. Because there's a lot of other stores that give you bullshit all the time. I my This store that I... I spent all my money on when I first got into bourbon. I mean, I was in there all the time buying bottles because I, I really didn't have anything. So I would buy whatever he had out. And he, he said, you know, keep coming in, keep buying. I'm going to get you, you know, some pappy. I'm going to get you this. I'm going to get you that. And um, ended up, you know, telling me that he didn't end up getting anything. Come to find out, he put everything on Craigslist. So there was another store that said he never got a certain release. And then my buddy who works at a distributor said, uh, that's funny because I delivered two cases to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've seen it <laughs> so, before here in Kentucky. I mean, it's they'll, they'll, any store owner that is not a liquor barn is going to hold it back um, because they don't care about you know that sort of thing. But if you think about it, do they have a motive? Like their, their motive is to make more money. Uh, do you think it's, I mean, of course we're going to look at it as bad practice, and, and I hope that the people that listen to this and they understand that, they won't go and patron those stores, but how do you, I mean, how do you, can you blame them at the end of the day? No, I just, I wish it was just, it was more honest. I just wish it was more honesty in general and say, you know what, I got six bottles and six people had asked me for it a year ago, and I've gotten you two nice bottles you know, a couple months ago, I just got to spread it around a little bit. Yeah, I've always thought, like, if I own my own store, what's the most fair way to handle that? And I don't, I don't know that I, there's really a good answer for it, but I think just being honest about it goes a long way. You know, I totally respect that. Right, and I think we could spend hours talking about what's the, the fairest way to do it, but I think that leads us into our last one since we are reaching towards the top here. And it's, it's, again, back to the store owners, right? And they're going ahead and they are marking up the prices of bottles to secondary market prices because they're saying, well, people are going to pay for them. I might as well collect that kind of money. I don't even care. Like, they're going to mark it up. And, you know, there, there's a group on Facebook that will post the store and post the pictures and the prices. And um, the store owner says, well, people are paying this and people are paying it online. And that's what we're going to set it at. And I think... I don't know. I mean, it's, it's annoying. It's dumb as hell for them to say that. I mean, you know, what about all your loyal customers that have been coming there all year who now are not able to get a nice bottle because you want $5,000 for it? Uh, what are those people going to say? Are you, are you even care about customers at that point, or is it all about just making profit? Right. I mean, Blake, what do you think? I mean, do you think it's, it's yeah, justified no, for I've them had to do that, it? Well, it, it's tough. It, it's like because I can only think about it from an accounting standpoint as well. It's like, what is the inventory due to sit on the shelf? You know, you, you price it at something that moves. And sitting, you know, I have this conversation with a store that has a Michter's 20 almost every time I go in there. It's like, don't price it at $1,500 because that's over what I could get it for on the secondary. If you price it at, you know, maybe half of that, somebody would probably buy it. Well, then you you know, put that back into buying more inventory. But what's the point of just letting it sit there like a trophy with a price tag that basically guarantees it's going to sit there as a trophy for the next three to five years, you know? Which my favorite one with that as well is stores that say, well, this is what it's selling for on eBay. I'm like, well, they haven't sold bourbon or any alcohol on eBay since I think it was 2010 or 2011, so I'm not sure who told you that. But, yeah, uh, so we can call your BS there. Yeah, yeah. If you want it to just sit there, just put a sticker that says not for sale. But if you want to put a $5,000 price tag on it, you're just making people angry who come in here and know what they're talking about and consistently buy from you 
and you know it, it's basically just guaranteeing that I will never shop at that store again. And I've had you know I've had that conversation more in the last probably year and a half than the past five years combined. It, it's kind of just a part of it at this point. As much as I hate to say it, the stores start to hear how much everyone's paying and assume they're missing out on money. Right, so. and I think that's just going to be the trend we're going to see in the next year, even four to five, is that uh, the stuff is just going to get harder to come by and uh, because of those exact things. Uh, it's just like Beanie Babies, just see, like so, dogs or anything else we talked about, <laughs> right? I think that's mm-hmm. dumb in the fact that if you piss off the people who are going to come to your store all the time, you're going to lose their money. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think that's even more dumb in the fact that, sure, you may gain $2,000 and pure profit from a bottle, but the guy who was going to come to your store all the time because you rewarded him for shopping there all year with a pappy, it's not going to come anymore. So you've lost his Ooh. money. And, and to be honest, I'd prefer them just to go straight to Craigslist and try to sell it instead of just letting it sit on a shelf for, you know, just say, oh, yeah, we got it, and we there were three – you know, we got three bottles, and there were three customers that spent a lot of money with us, and go put it on Craigslist instead of just letting it sit on a shelf with a price tag that, you know, is completely unreasonable. Then you get the stores like, yeah, who knows, some uh, Wall Street executive may walk in. I'm like, oh, really? A Wall Street executive is going to come down to Jacksonville, Florida, and he's going to decide <laughs> that this is the bottle for him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, this isn't fitting wines, right? So we, we yeah. throw that one up. Yeah. <laughs> that's the top ten list, right? But I don't think we touched on the marketing bullshit that's in bourbon right now. <laughs> so – if with any hot market with anything, people are going to want to hop aboard, right? And they're going to want to try the Brendan Rye right now, or hot as can be. So I think within the last year or so, there's just been a crazy amount of bullshit marketing with bourbon or rye that just doesn't meet that level of marketing. And people are buying this stuff up. And, you know, nowadays, like, a really good bourbon has to come in a wooden case. You know, you get a wooden case, like, ooh, man, this is this is legit. This has a wooden case, and it's got a, a lid over it, and the, the label talks all about, you know, it's funny I mentioned this. I have um, Orphan Barrel and the Knob Creek and Blood Oath right in front of me. Definition it, you know, like, right there. I was going to say three prime examples. So. Yeah. I know, but the shit is selling, and everybody, people are buying it up. People that are not informed are buying it up because it looks cool, and we're afraid of missing out. There's a huge thing of fear of missing out, FOMO, in the world mm-hmm. of bourbon. We are afraid of passing up a release that somebody else is going to have, and we're going to kick ourselves for not buying it. So you almost feel like you have to buy every rare release to make sure you don't miss out on it. Did you get the hard sell at Total Wine about Rhetoric 22 whenever you picked up your Van Winkle 12 today? <laughs> no, you know why? Because their stores are filled with their own private label crap. That is, they are trying to market uh, yeah. it and sell. Yeah. The guy today was like, well, I mean, you know, if you're into the rare bourbon, <laughs> you probably want to try this Red Eric 22. I was like, well, I don't really like the 21, now, so I doubt I'm going <laughs> to. I mean, of course. And, the, yeah, if you look, Total Wine's a whole different story. You walk down the aisle and you see this, like, bourbons you've never seen before in your life because all of it is made by Terrapier in South Carolina. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, you know, what, my first investigative article is gonna be about Total Wine. Yeah, Terrapier is yeah. one that nobody really talks about, but they make a lot. You, you know, MGP kind of gets the big uh, rap as the NDP backer, but Terrapier has a lot of bourbon out there that I think people don't realize they're drinking, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah, that's another podcast. <laughs> another podcast. So, um, I just, yeah, I think when we talk about the marketing bullshit, like with bourbon, people just need to understand that you don't have to run out. You don't have to buy every rare, uh, so-called rare that the store owner tells you sitting in front of you. You don't have to buy it all just because it's there. You don't have to buy it all. You're not going to miss out. There's going to be plenty of it to come around, and if all of us as a whole just stopped buying into all of that, maybe it would start to die down a little bit. 
And there's a term for people who buy into that. What's, what is it? Go ahead and kind of give a spoiler <laughs> work in case uh, all these other people stop. out here that are going to get called that when they try to do this, all these all these cardinal sins or cardinal rules, and they break those on, on a forum somewhere. Yeah, so it's called a tater, which still drives me nuts because I don't know when a potato became something that shops for dumb stuff, but it did, and tater is just – just became one of those words to describe people who fall for marketing BS and hype train and um, I just wish the word would die, but it won't. Especially, especially not when they have like animated gifs of it uh, on yeah. Facebook that you can do it with, like a potato <laughs> waving yeah. at you. That one may be here to stay, unfortunately. You know, I posted this list on Reddit, and I think every response had tater in it, so that's fine. I'm yeah. sure that went well. I'm, pretty, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure all three of us have been accused of being a tater, so there's 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 yeah. a love loss between us. Yeah. So, gentlemen, I want to say thank you again for being on the podcast tonight. Blake, thanks for uh, coming in last minute and co-hosting with me and uh, throwing in your quick anecdotes and all that, that knowledge you have to share. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. And Carrie, you as well, thanks for coming on and uh, writing this list and gave us a good laugh tonight. And I hope uh, all the listeners out there have an understanding of uh, don't break these 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 rules of the road when you're going out and trying to buy bourbon or starting to look for it or getting into hunting and, and all those good things. Like Try to uh, try to be a good citizen about it and find your own damn store. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or break all ten, and I'll mention you by name in my next blog article. There you go. <laughs> if you get a personal shout-out. Yeah. So uh, you two, give give, uh, give a quick plug for both your websites real quick before we uh, we close out. Check it out at bourboner.com. That's bourbon with an R on the end uh, for reviews, posts, and a lot of other mash bill stuff related. So check it out when you get a chance. My website is suburbia.com. It's S-U-B-O-U-R-B-I-A.com. So be sure to uh, join the mailing list there. Hop onto Twitter. Follow bourbon underscore gamer. Yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll be posting some of the dumb stuff that you say. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So if you like what you hear, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. You can find us by just typing in the word bourbon in there. Uh, also, if you are a fan of the show, you want to support the show, you want to also get cool stuff, we've got koozies, we've got t-shirts, we've got stickers, we've got all kinds of cool things, uh, please support us on Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Bourbon Pursuit. Also, make sure as uh, to follow both Bourboner and Bourbon Gamer on Twitter. Make sure you also follow, follow Bourbon Pursuit. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook as well as follow us on Instagram to kind of get all three of those social media channels coming at you from all angles. Uh, so once again, thank you all for being on the show today, and we will see you all next time. This podcast of Bourbon Pursuit is in partnership with thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for news and reviews for people who like whiskey, and for those who think a life without whiskey has no style, thewhiskeywash.com. Mm-hmm.